Hi everyone, we're just going to look at how I started the creation of this quick demon sketch in ZBrush. So right away I start off with a Dynamesh Sphere project and I keep the resolution pretty low and you can see here I'm just exploring silhouette by um, switching the color in my material to black and it, it uh, makes it a, a nice flat color where I can see uh, just the silhouette without the um, any kind of uh, distraction from inner lying forms. Uh, usually I'd probably take a little little bit longer to explore different shapes, but in this case uh, it's kind of in a hurry and, and trying to replicate uh, the process they use on face-off, which is basically they don't have a lot of time to design something and you know they, they have to kind of go with the first design they have. So that was kind of the exercise of this whole project. And uh, here you can see I'm just pulling out shapes using the clay buildup and uh, drawing in shapes with the Damien Standard brush and just using the move tool to kind of um, manipulate larger forms and this is sped up around six times so the whole project uh, both videos everything together would have been around 10 hours uh, worth of work so basically uh, something you could do in a day and that was kind of the, the idea behind this whole exercise. And here I'm just using uh, the Damien Standard Brush to draw in details. And uh, if you use the Alt function on the Damien Standard Brush, you can actually bring out form. So I sometimes use it to create uh, nice hard edges. And uh, here I'm just exploring different shapes that would kind of convey the idea of, of, of a, dynamic, uh, a dem demonic being or, or something like that. You know, uh, For one thing, one of the parameters is that it had to have horns. And so I uh, incorporated some kind of a horn structure. And here I'm just exploring kind of, uh, you know, different lines on, on the face, see if I can get any happy accidents going on. And for the most part, I, I figured it was going to be kind of a humanoid uh, for the most part, uh, almost as though it was a prosthetic makeup applied on, a, on an actor. So I kind of went with that. Uh, here I think I'm looking at um, kind of creating that slight snarl look that uh, was very prominent on shows like uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and uh, similar similar series and uh, just trying to uh, figure out shapes uh, around the chin and mouth area I'm working with a lot of triangles because triangles make things look uh, you know kind of evil and uh, here I'm using the rake tool actually, which is, is a tool I, I like to use once in a while to kind of um, change the surface to give me a, a better understanding of forms. And then usually I go uh, back to the clay buildup, which is kind of my go-to brush. I don't use a lot of different brushes. Uh, I use a, the clay buildup as my main brush, and then I use the move brush. I use a Damien standard for uh, drawing in areas or, or you know trying to figure out anatomy. Uh, or doing hard hard edges, things like that. But I like to draw with the Demon Standard Brush on the model um, to, to kind of create forms and see if they work. And uh, in this case, I'm just breaking apart the model to make the horns into a separate subtool so I can work with them a little bit easier. And also separating them from the head allows me to work on the head easier. So uh, that's what you see right there. And of course, every Dynamesh to, to close the meshes. Uh, again, the resolution is still fairly low on these. It's not that high. Uh, once I get the forms, once I get the primary forms done, I'll, and I'm into my secondary forms, I, I will up the res a little bit. And in my tertiary forms, uh, usually what I like to do is actually um, kind of retopologize the whole model uh, using um, Z Remesher and then project the details onto um, multi subdivision. Um, mesh so I can go and uh, change the subdivision levels um, and and, uh, and work that way well, when I need if I want to use make bigger moves I can actually go into a lower uh, subdivision level and uh, work on the model a lot easier and then when I want to create details I can go into the highest subdivision levels and kind of move back and forth that way uh, a lot of benefits to working in that way because um, First of all, the, the the lines you create are a lot cleaner when, when you have a really uh, properly subdivided mesh as opposed to a Dynamesh. Um, but it depends what you're doing. Uh, you'll see later on in the video I actually end up going back to Dynamesh because uh, I make some 
pretty drastic changes. I didn't like the way it went. So uh, I went back in and I, I fixed it up and I ended up just using the DynaMesh in the end. Although I do go back to subdivision levels when, when it comes to poly painting. In this case, it's just a very quick concept piece, so it doesn't have to be perfect. And uh, obviously, with such a small time frame, it's not going to be my best work either. So um, the exercise was just trying to get something that was usable in a very short amount of time, and um, not necessarily something that would have been like screen or, or game ready or anything like that. Here I'm just using. Uh, although this is ZBrush 4R8, I'm using the transpose um, tool for manipulating the, the size of the head and the width. Uh, I'm just I haven't really played around with the gizmo yet, so I'm just keeping to the the old school uh, transpose line. I'm using the clay brush a little bit here and there, and clay build up again. Uh, you can tell you can see I don't really try to smooth that much. Uh, I, I like to keep the sculpture rough and uh, kind of fresh looking. Uh, I find if, if you do smooth it um, too too much while you're working on it, it can kind of uh, get rid of a lot of the nice little happy accidents that happen. Or, or the it, can, it kind of looks a little bit too uh, sterile and, and pristine. So um, this kind of harks back to my more traditional sculpting days where we we only smoothed out the sculpture uh, towards the very end. And I think that's a good practice in digital sculpture as well. You know, the smooth brush, usually if you're, if you're there sitting around smoothing your sculpture, it means you're, you're kind of stuck on it. And so um, if, if that happens, you should maybe walk away and, and, or look up reference and, and try to see uh, where you're stuck and then work out the problem. I kind of like the lines on his face. I'm just looking at this now. In hindsight, I should have probably kept them. They look kind of cool. If I was do, if I had more time, I would have probably kept this and made a duplicate and then and uh, manipulated that as opposed to wrecking uh, the work I did on here. That way, you have multiple kind of uh, little sketches that you can go back and say and, and pick the best one. But again, in this case, I was just working with one and. Um, after a certain amount of hours, you kind of stop seeing things, and I guess I kind of uh, went over this work and uh, and just erased those lines. And uh, it's kind of looking like a little bit of a cling on here, so I think I go back eventually and just kind of start taking that back. Also, there's some some problems with the plane of the face like I noticed that the eyes are a little too sunken in and um, later on I, I, I addressed those but I didn't really notice while I was doing it and again because I was kinda going through this um, and after a certain amount of hours you kinda stop seeing the defects So I'm very I'm using a very limited um, amount of tools. I'm using the clear build up Damien standard trim dynamic for creating any flat areas. Uh, here you can see I'm using the snake hook brush to bring out those little horns or, or protrusion from his face. Uh, I also used the um, instead of the the smooth brush I actually use the the soft polish. Uh, I'll use that, and uh, I sometimes use, use the inflate brush to bring out forms if, if I flatten them too much and or if I want to bring two forms together I use that uh, but for the most part that's about it I don't really use that many brushes uh, the standard brush is great for creating little highlights on, on muscles and things like that um, but overall I would say the, the majority of work I do is with the clay buildup and I use the alt function to to press in and the regular function to, to bring out the material And just some exp exploring some ideas uh, on the neck. Uh, I don't think I do that much detail on the neck after. I, f I, f I started to find that this character was becoming really busy. 
And all that is is me drawing it in with the Damien Standard Brush. And, and this is a practice I do a lot. I actually uh, do it when I do traditional sculpture as well. I'll take a, a sharp tool and, and, and redraw elements that may have gotten lost during the modeling process to, to kind of uh, get me back on track or, or to try to um, look at elements and, and, and design, design features um, before I actually commit to them. So I just find that process works for me, drawing it in and then taking a look. And here I'm just smoothing some things back and then redrawing them with the clay buildup. Now unfortunately, my ideas weren't super clear when I was making this character and um, I think it does suffer a little bit from that. I think it does get better towards the end, uh, but it would have it would have been better if I had done a bunch of thumbnails first. But again, I was just trying to replicate the kind of process they use on Face Off, and uh, they, you know they basically design one thing and then have to go with it and make it work. And so I was just trying to do that. I didn't open up the eyes because I felt that um, at the time it was just easier to concentrate on the hole and, and not really focus on the eyes so much. Almost like he's a, a life mask. Uh, I, I like to do that sometimes, just um, focus on the on the uh, overall and not on the eyes directly. So I just keep them closed, and it kind of has this cool, you know, kind of like you're working on a on a life on a life cast. I think next time I will probably use a, the scan of somebody's head and actually um, use that as a base to model on top of as it was a prosthetic and that way I won't get to, um, uh, this in discrepancy with uh, kind of facial planes that I have with this guy having the eyes too sunken in or whatever and it kind of re replicates a design that would be possible to do for a prosthetic as opposed to you know just something that might not be entirely possible in the physical world, but it's quite possible in the digital world. Um, but having that, uh, I guess that digital life cast, uh, that scan that acts like a digital life cast, you know, you can, it helps you uh, to not cheat and uh, makes it a little bit more believable. That way you can't have to, you have to go with what the actors features are and, and work from those because not all actors uh, will, will work not all, all features will work with a certain kind of shape so if you ever have the opportunity to actually work on a life cast with clay it's actually pretty interesting it's a lot of fun but it can it does limit you to um, whatever shapes you have underlying with the with the actors actual face you know, you can't make something skinnier than the actor's face, so you have to kind of uh, play with shapes to give the illusion uh, of, of skinnier forms or, or maybe um, other design elements that um, can't go beyond the, the actor's actual head. I'm not sure if that makes any sense. Still using the clay buildup and the clay brush. I like the clay brush for blending forms together, especially if they're deep. The clay brush tends to fill in deeper areas first, and then the um, the other planes uh, later on. So you get this nice kind of fleshy feel to it. Uh, I find it hard to use initially to sketch things out. That's why I like the clay buildup because it has a, that nice kind of texture to it. But the um, the clay brush is great for adding like that soft transitional. Uh, tissue, if you want to call it, in between forms and kind of soften things up. So that's what I usually like to use it. And that's later on in the process. And here I just, I just uh, changed material. This is actually a, a clay material by an artist named Zebro. And I don't have the address for his website, but you can download these from his website. If you just do um, a search for Zebro, you'll you'll go to his blog, 
and he has uh, uh, several Mac cabs which are excellent. These are really, really nice to use and, and they, they have a great feel to them. And uh, the, you know, the standard materials that come with ZBrush are great and I, I use them a lot, especially I use the very basic, um, you know, the matte cap gray or the basic material or the blend material. Um, but sometimes it's nice to, to change up material to kind of get a different view uh, of, of, the, of the design. And here, I, what I did was, uh, I believe I, I uh, Z remasked this model and turned it into a multiple subdivision model. And here, I'm just adding uh, a ton of details using alphas and, and things like that. And I think at this stage, I was kind of getting tired of this because I've been working on it so long, and I just kind of wanted wanted to get it done. And uh, I hadn't quite resolved the overall design, uh, or at least I wasn't seeing the overall design. I wasn't super happy with the way this looked. So, but here I am adding uh, a ton of details, and it ends up being way too busy. Um, so I, I eventually end up toning it back. But that's kind of the process, you know. It's it might look like a step backwards, and it's probably not the most efficient thing, but. Um, it's part of the process and it, it got to the final result that I ended up having. And here you can see the multiple uh, resolution, multiple subdivision levels being put to work. And what's nice about uh, having multiple subdivision levels is that you can have uh, details on your highest level and then you drop it down and you make some changes on the lower level. And when you res back up, it doesn't erase your fine details. So that's that's a great benefit to using uh, multiple subdivision levels. And uh, the picture on on the on the left of your screen is just some reference, some poor reference. And um, I really went overboard on this. So it's a good lesson to learn. You know, you can. Adding details to uh, structures that aren't quite finished um, doesn't really help your sculpture. And also I found that when I was rendering this in Keyshot, the, the, it was just too much detail. It kind of looked, it didn't, didn't quite give the look that I wanted. So um, I end up toning it back and it, it gives a much nicer result. So in order to add these fine details, you got to have a pretty um, high resolution mesh. I think this is maybe uh, close to the 8 million or a little over the 8 million polygons. And I did not, uh, when I Z remesh this, I didn't do it efficiently. So you, there's, there's ways of doing it where you can add more resolution where you need it. You know, So for instance, I didn't need that much resolution on the neck or in the back um, or the bottom of the bust. Uh, I could have, you know, um, told ZBrush to Z remesh that at a lower resolution level and, and kept more of the resolution around the areas of the face that I needed more resolution. That would have been a, a better way to go. Uh, but again, I was doing this on a very um, quick time schedule. So, and again, I hadn't, you know, I haven't really resolved these areas. Um, very well and uh, you know I'm just kind of adding details on top of here and I think I went with some kind of a snake skin alpha that I found or a reptile alpha that I found on uh, at the download center on the Pixelogic website and I, I guess I had the idea that he was gonna have this kind of reptilian skin and of course I was getting tired at this point so I wasn't even using any reference which is a really big mistake But you can see how quickly you can create details. And, and right now I'm just trying to get something over all the areas. So there's no areas where, um, you know, there's, there's nothing that has been uh, resolved. And then I'm going to go and tighten it up. But like I said, it, I kind of, I, was, I kind of scratched a lot of this stuff out. So, and here I'm just looking at uh, rendering of different materials to try to get a, 
get my see if I can see any defects because at this point I, I can't really see anything wrong or right and here I actually decided to take symmetry off and I, I nudged some of the the shapes to to kind of uh, get rid of that um, perfectly symmetrical look Yeah, you know, a lot of the process when you're learning ZBrush is to understand when to do what and when. You know, there's there's a certain resolution that's good for modeling certain details, and certain resolution that's good for for modeling um, really fine details. And knowing when and where to do that is actually part of the process and part of the the battle. Because if you do it too early on, it kind of it kind of doesn't work very well. But the great thing about ZBrush is that you can always fix it. You know. There's many ways to go back and, and just reproject details, and I've done it several times. Or to go, you know, you, if you make a mistake and you find that your mesh your mesh is just not, um, you, you may have subdivided your mesh and it's not working for you. You can always go back, z, z remesh it, and reproject the details from uh, a duplicate. Or you could do this. You could go back into DynaMesh and then reproject the details from uh, another model. So you, you never really um, lose what you what you've done. You know, there's there's ways of getting it back. But every time you go back and forth, you kind of, it's you know, you lose efficiency. And but again, that's kind of part of the learning process. And for me, sometimes I have to go through this whole process of texturing something and and adding details, just to figure out what I want to end up with or, or how to do a certain type of texture or skin or skin detail and then I'll just go back and erase it all and then <clears throat> you know do the process over because uh, I learned how to do it but I didn't apply it properly so that's pretty much what you're seeing here I'm spending a lot of time doing something that I'm eventually gonna erase but that's okay So I, I hadn't really figured out what that whole cowl at the top was supposed to be made out of. I, I, I figured it was going to be some kind of a hard bone. And this is the problem when you don't use reference. Uh, I didn't use reference for this guy. And that was a really big mistake. But again, on face-off, you know, they don't really have time to go and source out all these references. Or, or at least that's what it looks like on the show. Maybe they do. But it's ideal. You should definitely have um, a much clearer picture of what you want to make and the references that you can take from before tackling on the project because um, if you don't have a clear idea of what you want or at least 60% of, of what you want then it kind of becomes very difficult and you everything kind of gets muddled. Having said that, you know, this is just a sketch. I don't really care if it doesn't win any awards or anything like that, you know. But it was just kind of an exercise for myself, so. And uh, it, it was also um, kind of a trial to try to figure out a process for creating um, characters very quickly. And so I did learn quite a bit from it, and I, I did learn that definitely having maybe doing some sketches ahead of time and gathering references is, is, a, is a is a better approach than what I did so I didn't really save anything by not you know going in and, and researching reference because researching for you know the reference does take quite a bit of time but it's definitely worth it so what I learned is is don't skip that and definitely take the time in that because it uh, actually saves you time in the end and it makes a much more believable sculpture Again, just experimenting, different mat caps, trying to see if I can see any defects and trick my brain into seeing things. And uh, tried to grab some other alphas. Now there's a, a much more robust alpha system in ZBrush 4R8 where you can actually have overhangs and undercuts. 
and uh, I haven't quite learned how to use it yet because I just basically installed 4R8 at the time of this this video. So I, I didn't want to play with it. So I kind of kept to the the usual uh, alphas from um, from other versions of ZBrush. But actually, that would have been a much better solution to, to creating scales and, and horns and things like that because you can get really, really nice details. So I'll probably create another project where I'm going to incorporate the use of those type of alphas or VDMs, I think they're called because I definitely have to learn it. And it's a great exercise just to do a sketch or something to, to learn a new process or or, um, or function of an, of, of an application because then you can you can use it when you're when you have a real project because you definitely don't want to experiment when you're, when you're doing something for somebody else under tight deadlines. Uh, here you can see I'm taking some of the detail down using the smooth uh, peaks and valleys. Sorry, smooth peaks, not peaks and valleys. There's two different brushes. If you go in the light box, there's a, a smooth brush folder and there's a, a lot of cool little smooth brushes that you can use. And one of them is smooth peaks and the other one is smooth valleys. And smooth peaks basically will just smooth any um, the tops of, of bumps and things like that. So it's great for creating skin and uh, toning things back without getting rid of like the little details like pores that you might want to keep. If you were to do that with the regular smooth, uh, unless you mask out the pores, it's just going to pretty much uh, blur everything. But So take a look at your light box in uh, different brushes because usually there's, uh, even for the trim, trim brushes there's there's you know so many different types of, of trim brushes I tend to use the trim dynamic mostly but there's there's so many and here I'm just trying to work on the horns a little bit um, I didn't really go in with any particular type of horn again I should have used some reference and reference some actual horns it would have made it look a little bit more believable uh, they kinda look like tree roots but again, this is just kind of, this would be a preliminary kind of concept, you know, that you could present to somebody or a quick sketch for myself just to try things out. And, uh, you know, from there I could take this character further. But here I'm just adding alphas just to kind of give the overall, overall texture, horn texture. You can see the holes in his ears are, are basically, I was going to add plugs in, uh, into his ears. Give him kind of a tribal look. Although I'm not sure why a demon would have plugs, but I, I think they look kind of cool. Yeah, so here's where I, I reprojected everything onto a, a sub, um, multiple subdivision mesh and uh, I smooth out the brow which I did not like at all and here I'm, I'm, I masked it out and uh, crash the brush at the same time but I mask out the forehead so that when I do the reproject it uh, actually won't reproject and change um, my brow so that I can go in after and correct it and I also go back into Dynamesh because I'm making so many changes that it would really screw up the, the multi-resolution um, the, the multiple subdivision mesh uh, so I just decided to re-dynamesh it and I find that the level of detail of the dynamesh is enough to is enough to read on uh, when I render so and here I'm trying to fix up the mouth which has become very symmetrical but uh, there's still some problem with the shapes. The the planes of the face aren't quite there. That's what I'm struggling with right now. And here I'm just kind of... So I haven't gone into Dynamesh yet, but I will later on. And here I'm just kind of nudging everything to try to get rid of that symmetry and adding scars because, you know, I like adding scars for some reason. It's just my thing, I guess. Here I'm just adding a, a nose ring. 
I don't know, I have a thing with nose rings and, and plugs, I guess. In hindsight, I think I probably should have added some tattoos too, it would have looked kind of cool. Or maybe some scarification. And uh, that's pretty much it for the, the first part. You're gonna see in the second video I make a lot of a lot more changes than I start, and I actually poly paint this model, and uh, it looks a lot better. And here I'm just trying to fix the mouse. I don't know, I had a real problem with that mouse. And there you go. And this is pretty much the end of part one, and we'll continue on in part two and do some poly painting while we're at it. Thanks for watching.